Welcome back to .NET Rocks. This is Carl Franklin. And this is Richard Campbell. And I've been busy, man. I'm busy preparing for Keto Fest. Oh, yeah. No kidding. I just saw um, Mr. Morris on his way up from the other hemisphere getting yep. ready to keto the heck out of things. That's right. And, of course, this has already happened by the time this comes out. But mm -hmm. uh, Jim Holmes is going to try to make it. That's going to be cool. That's nice. Yep. And uh, I, we've been doing a lot of home improvement, sort of yard improvement and, you know, that kind of stuff, weeding, cleaning out the garage, just sort of general home improvement trying to, you know, because basically on the Friday before, on the weekend, there's a big party at my house, a VIP party. So the VIP party is at your place and you've yeah. got a good size house, but it's a lot of people. Well, we had to use the front lawn as well as the back deck this year, just because there's twice as many people. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Just so, so that everybody knows, this is an event that I put on and we used Kickstarter to, to do it. I didn't know anybody who used Kickstarter to sell tickets in advance, but turns out you can. Sure. Yeah. But it basically means you could set that sort of floor of this is the minimum we need to, to at least pay the bills. Right. And, and if you don't get it, you don't go ahead. You don't do it. That's right. And everybody who donates and buys a ticket really wants it to happen. So they spread the word. And it sort of goes viral, and it worked. It was second year in a row. Good for you, man. Well done. Yeah. That's what I got. Awesome. Uh, but I also got another Better Know Framework, so maybe we should roll the music. Okay. Okay. All right, dude. What do you got? I think I've done this one before, but it's really cool. It's Uppy. Uppy? Uppy. It's a sleek, modular JavaScript file uploader that integrates seamlessly with any application, huh. fast and easy to use and lets you worry about more important problems than building a file uploader. Story of my life. It's a solved problem, right? Yeah. Fetch files from disk, remote URLs, Google Drive, Dropbox, Instagram, or Snap, and record selfies with a camera. How cool is that? That's pretty cool. Do you use Uppy for our editor? Uh, I don't currently. You did write your own uploader for the... Uh, well, for the Windows version, yeah. But okay. for the web version, I did drop in a... I dropped in something, but it wasn't Uppy. I Uppy. can't remember what it was now. Okay. Maybe it should be Uppy. But I have used Uppy, and it's really cool. Nice. Good one. That's what I got. Like it, like it, like it. Who's talking to us? I grabbed a comment off of show 1387, which is from December of 2016, so a while ago now. One Corey House talking about JavaScript development environments. And I really appreciated this show back in the day because Corey's got a pretty broad view of the JavaScript landscape and we're talking about different tooling. I think we spent a lot of time uh, on the React side and mm. got a ton of comments in that space, which of course, most of which Corey responded to directly. But uh, I particularly like this comment from Anthony Abel, who said, thank you so much for the conversation. It was very informative to me as I've been searching for an appropriate entry point into modern JavaScript development. Hmm. Originally, I'd intended to be a, as vanilla as possible, but I have constant anxiety about reinventing the wheel and an attraction to shiny new things. Uh, Simply trying to establish the lineage of all the different frameworks and deduce which are effectively deprecated or abandoned was highly frustrating. When I found the React tic-tac-toe tutorial, I was immediately attracted to all of it. The code is beautiful, but especially the sense of security that I was getting closer to the pulse of the community, and that what I was learning was relevant and useful. I am an amateur at best. However, I've been scripting for 20 years, so I understand the fundamentals of programming. I find myself constantly trying the next Hello World tutorial, not learning how to program, but to learn how to use this next collection of tools and frameworks as a working model that I can actually use to move forward with my ideas. So thank you again for finally speaking with some authority and unifying some of these concepts for me. You've really illuminated some of the invisible walls that I've been bumping into. Wow. I like Anthony's metaphors there. They're right? nice. It's just yeah. this, yeah, this grouping of problems to just trying to, you know, I think we spent a long time on that whole concept of the tribes of JavaScript, that these sets of tools that work together and, and uh, talking to folks in the different spaces. Mm -hmm. And it is interesting to see these days when you talk about very successful JavaScript frameworks, one of the things is that they're backed by big dev teams, right? If you think about Angular with Google. Mm. And, and React is a Facebook tool, as I recall. Mm. Yeah. That's what I hear. That's <laughs> what I hear. So, you know, when, when you got a company like Facebook backing you up, it's hard to be too upset. Mm. So, Anthony, thank you so much for your comment. 
a copy of Music to Code By is on its way to you. And if you'd like a copy of Music to Code By, write a comment on the website at .netrocks.com or via any of our social media. Because we publish every show to Facebook and Google+. Plus. And if you comment there and we read it on the show, we'll send you a copy of Music to Code By. Absolutely. And definitely follow us on Twitter. I'm at Carl Franklin. He's at Rich Campbell. Send us a tweet. They make us react all uppy. <laughs> <laughs> just, I'm all just uppy. chaining words together. I'm all uppy. Hey, um, before I introduce Corey, you know, speaking of bumping into invisible walls, did I ever tell you the story about my youngest daughter when she was probably, well, Clara, when she was probably, I don't know, seven, and her sister, Emmy, who's six years older than her, she, I go to pick up Clara, you know, for ballet practice, right? And she's at her house and uh, uh, where she lives with her mom. And maybe she was eight. I don't know. So she comes out crying. And I say, Clara, why are you crying? And she goes, I ran into the glass door. And I'm like. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I said, she goes, Emmy laughed at me. I said, why? I bumped it. I ran into the glass door. I said, <laughs> and she goes, it's not funny. And I'm like, it's a little bit funny. <laughs> it's a little bit funny. <laughs> it's a li-. She was, she was, uh, started laughing after that. Yep. It's a little bit funny. So, Corey House is a principal consultant at reactjsconsulting.com, where he helps teams transition to modern JavaScript and React. Corey is a Pluralsight author, Microsoft MVP, software architect, and international speaker. He has trained over 10,000 software developers at conferences and businesses worldwide. Corey has authored Pluralsight courses on JavaScript, React, C Sharp, and ASP.NET, and he is active on Twitter as at HouseCore, H-O-U-S-E-C-O-R. Welcome back, Corey. Thank you for having me, Carl. You're so welcome. 10,000 peeps. That's a lot. Ah, uh, who's counting? Yeah, and if you if you consider all the uh, airplay you've had on .NET Rocks, you could probably triple that number. <laughs> and yet, I still don't have a mug. I need I need to write a good enough comment to get there. Oh well, heads are going to roll. We'll get that out to you, <laughs> sir. No problem. I'm going to keep trying. It'll be an honor. We'll have one printed with your name on it. Beautiful. Yeah. What's new in the world of uh, React and everything? GraphQL. This is your current passion, huh? Yeah, well, uh, it's it's an obvious choice for somebody that's already in React because uh, there's there's a lot of uh, well, th- there's a lot of synergy that comes from putting the two together. But the fact is that the two are not actually connected in any way, and I think that's uh, uh, actually one of the big benefits of GraphQL. I mean, I have gotten interested in it because um, what I see is a very general problem about how long we've been arguing over how to do APIs and how hard that conversation is to have at all. Because when somebody says, uh, I want to build a REST API, that gives us hardly any information at all um, because the word has come to mean so little uh, right. since everyone has their own take on it. And I often feel like when we have a conversation about REST APIs, it's it's a game of moving the goalposts. And when someone says, well, <laughs> yeah. a REST API does this, and I say, well, it actually typically doesn't. And people go, well, it should. And I go, well, is the goalpost the ideal or is the goalpost the pragmatic side? And when people say that the ideal is problematic, people point out, well, you don't have to do that. So the goalpost, it, it's a bit like nailing jello to the wall. Um, so for us to compare... REST APIs to RPCs to so to GraphQL, you do need to spend some time being very specific about what you mean about a REST API. And in fact, just yesterday, um, as, as a bit of preparation for this show, I put together a little Google form and I tweeted it out just asking people, hey, wh- what APIs are you building today? And when you say that you're building a REST API, what sorts of things are you actually doing there? Um, Because what I'm interested in is people talk about, okay, I'm building a REST API. Mm. Uh, Okay, well, does that mean that you're using uh, all the verbs? Are you using just get and put or Mm. get and post uh, Mm. like a lot of people do? Are you using put? Are you using patch? Um, How are you handling versioning? Are you using hypermedia? And there's all these sorts of questions that are left up to the author um, because in the end, REST is not a specification. It's... Uh, it's a design style that was more or less named from a 
a smart guy named Roy Fielding who wrote a dissertation and people started interpreting that. So I, I feel like I've spent a lot of years now having those um, having those debates and struggling like a lot of people have. So the, my excitement about GraphQL centers around the fact that I can send you to a URL that has a specification. And that specification says, do it this way, exactly this right. way. And, th- and that's beneficial. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of strong opinions uh, in programming because uh, a, a given framework avoids people spending a lot of time reinventing the wheel or having conversations about things that may not actually matter that much in the end. Right, right. So the whole idea is that you point this to an API and it gives you the metadata about it, right? What are the endpoints and what what can you do? Is that right? Yes, more or less. There, there's really two core ideas there. GraphQL is a, a specification that says, here's how you make your queries and here's how you define a schema. And what's nice about that is that specification says, okay, your queries end up looking something like JSON, except imagine that you took the quotes out uh, and uh, you pretty much have what looks like a GraphQL query. So the nice thing is in GraphQL, you end up declaring a query using uh, the shape that signifies what you'd like to receive. So if I want to receive a user with their first name and their last name, and I want to receive their address as a child object with their street and their city, then you can imagine in your head, well, I'd write some JSON that would look like that. Well, a React, uh, or I'm sorry, a GraphQL query is almost identical to that, except you take some quotes out and you don't declare the right hand side. It's easier to read. It is. It is very concise. And Mm -hmm. I I like that the query mirrors so closely what you're wanting. So it's Mm -hmm. a very uh, terse way to declare your desires. So this is something that you as an API builder would follow the spec. And then as an API consumer, you would also use it for discovery. What's the what's the story on the other side? Yeah, the story on discovery is interesting, too, because uh, you look at one of the other pain points that happens today in APIs. People struggle with knowing how to find all the APIs that sit out here in this world of microservices where lots of teams are standing up individual APIs. It becomes a separate problem of discovery where you have to say, all right, as a company, where are we documenting all these different APIs and how to authenticate each each one of those, um, what those endpoints are and what you get there? Well, what happens in GraphQL is you have a single endpoint, and that may not sound very scalable, but one thing that you can do is stitch different schemas together. Uh, And in that way, you could have one endpoint for an entire company, but that schema could be a mixture of schemas that are managed by many different teams, Uh, but it all sits behind one endpoint. So at that point, it Mm -hmm. ends up solving your discovery problem because now everybody knows here's the one endpoint go there and request what you want yeah. and and for that matter behind the scenes that endpoint may end up hitting rest apis it may end up making sql calls directly to various different databases it may be calling third party apis graphql is just this layer on the front that is giving you a way to declaratively ask for the data that you'd like right Interesting, you know, it, because if it, it, as soon as you said like I, I want to get information on API, I'm, I thought Wizdle because XML <laughs> is my friend. XML uh-huh. because XML <laughs> is my friend. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but and, and and of course SOAP as well, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, and and SOAP certainly uh, handled that. I, I look at a lot of what's going on in GraphQL, and I see uh, the, the very common. Uh, argument that I hear against GraphQL is, hey, a REST API can do that. And you're absolutely right, because since there's no specification for a REST API, a REST API can do anything. (laughs) Right. It's it's so amorphous that, yes, you could do these things. And in fact, depending on how you interpret uh, various uh, canonical reads on REST, um, then yes, you can say that... uh, all REST APIs should have hypermedia and all REST APIs should manage versioning a certain way and specifically use these uh, HTTP verbs in a certain way. But that conversation uh, is 
not particularly helpful because in the real world, people are doing things uh, very pragmatically. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. I, but I do believe that uh, as a company, you're, uh, you're likely to get an API out the door faster if everyone has a shared vision. And if everybody has clarity about how you want to build APIs at your company. And I do believe that the amount of freedom that people have when they choose to build an RPC style API or a RESTful API uh, is, is so significant that it's actually inhibiting people and causing us to um, not share enough lessons learned. So I, I really like that if we choose to use something like GraphQL, we are uh, hitting a very clear target and we avoid the conversations about all these other ways that we could choose to do pagination and filtering right. and sorting, uh, right, right. caching, et cetera. Because mm. it's, I mean, O data is the big thing, but Microsoft mm -hmm. w really led ages ago now. Before Microsoft was the open source centric company that it is today, at least on the dev side, O mm -hmm. data came along, and and of course now it's an Oasis standard and and so forth. And the O data dot org website opens with the best way to do REST. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting. So, so ODATA has been around since what, about 2007. Mm, uh, like so that, it's yeah. about 11 years now. And frankly, when ODATA came out, I was super excited. I was uh, at least as excited about it as I am about GraphQL today. Uh, and uh, I, I think uh, ultimately there's a couple of reasons that GraphQL is getting a lot of attention now. I think one thing that, that contrasts it from ODATA is that GraphQL isn't tied to any particular technology. And that's not quite fair either because neither is OData. You can use OData right. as a .NET dev or a Java dev or a, a what, C++. I, I can't remember how many other libraries there are out there, but mm. OData is most certainly not tied to a single stack. Um, but I think what's holding, uh, has held OData back is just the perception that it was tied to .NET developers. Um, right. And I, I think partially because Back in the day in 2007, before Microsoft had right. VS Code, for instance, and, and TypeScript and, and these, these um, technologies that really helped everybody see that Microsoft was truly open and interested in contributing to the community. Uh, like, I feel like if OData had come out in the last couple of years for Microsoft, it could have really caught fire. But now it has been around long enough that it doesn't seem to be getting the buzz that GraphQL is getting. Yeah, um, sure. Because people are associating it with unfair, unfairly with the old Microsoft instead of the new Microsoft, I suppose. Yeah, that's a fair criticism. I mean, Microsoft wasn't as open back then. And, uh, you know, the, you're, it's absolutely right. But what do you think about the, the technologies themselves? I mean, OData is open by its, mm -hmm. the first, you know, word in the acronym. Yeah, and, and I will tell you guys, um, and I warned you beforehand that it's been a lot of years since I used OData. Uh, the, what I remember of OData, um, GraphQL reminds me a lot of it. Frankly, I think they, uh, very much solve similar problems and, uh, you look at OData and I think probably the things that would set GraphQL apart from it is, uh, I believe with OData, there isn't anything that's equivalent to graphical or, um, GraphQL Playground, uh, and you guys correct me if I'm wrong, but I wasn't able to find anything that seemed synonymous with that. And by that, if you're not familiar, uh, the idea of being able to just pull up a, a URL and then run uh, ad hoc queries at your endpoint, see those results, mm. interact with the documentation in a standardized way. So effectively using introspection to look at the schema and generate these docs uh, for you, effectively for free. Mm. Do, which I, I haven't seen anything like that for OData, but if, if somebody knows, um, certainly chime in in the comments because I'd be interested in it. And it does seem to be one of the strengths of GraphQL is it is much more receptive to diverse data sets and combining data sets, uh, you know, more of a queryable engine. I am I have gone and looked at, OData is an open source project. It's on GitHub. It's not dead per se, its rate of change is very low. They, they are getting issues every month or so, and they are accepting pull requests. I, it looks like one, every month or so a pull request gets put through. Now, one would argue that's because this thing is done, like it does mm -hmm. what it's supposed to do. 
but it's certainly not new and fresh and shiny. And it is uh, in its own sort of container. The, you know, you today, if Microsoft was doing this, they this would be inside the Microsoft space on GitHub, not the OData space. Mm-hmm. But one would argue, one would wonder if this was important to Microsoft today, if they wouldn't handle it differently, if they wouldn't revive it in some respects. Um, yeah. There's, there's also doesn't seem to be much energy around OData and .NET Core because mm-hmm. it kind of predates all of that. Yeah. What, one of the things that I looked at was uh, going out to Google Trends for what it's worth and, and getting mm-hmm. a sense of where OData has tracked uh, versus GraphQL. And what you see is OData had a rapid rise and then has been pretty well steady uh, since about 2009, 2010. Um, and then so... GraphQL is pretty young. GraphQL was uh, open sourced in uh, 2015 and since then has rapidly risen. And uh, at, at this point, at least on Google Trends, is, is well ahead of OData, but we'll see whether that um, continues to uh, exist. I mean, what I see is um, an, an opportunity for some company to come out here and resolve the core problem, which is rest needs a, a strong popular specification and and mm, given right. there, there are others out there um json api i'm a big fan of it if, if i'm building a plain rest api that would be a, a popular choice that that i would lean toward yeah although actually implementing that isn't trivial because uh again if you're working in c sharp or you're working in java or you're working in python you're going to write completely different code there and the spec isn't going to help you get there. So th- that's right. one of the the nice things about GraphQL is it's not merely a spec. It's also an ecosystem that allows you to get that spec by uh, almost automatically pull down a project and have an example query running there, hmm. um, have graphical running that you can interact with right away. So there's not a, a level of friction like you would have in the REST space choosing uh, an existing standard. Hey guys, hold that thought right there while we pause for this very important message. Hey, Carl here to say that Music to Code By is now an app called Music to Flow By. Now you can listen to the tracks on your phone with offline capability. The first three tracks are free, and the entire catalog is available by subscription with a new track arriving every month. Just go to musictoflowby.com for all the links. All right, and we're back. It's .NET Rocks. Carl Franklin, Richard Camlin, Corey House is in the house, and we're talking about uh, GraphQL. We did a show, geez, in, in 2017, I believe, July, like about a year ago now, with uh, Steve Faulkner. And as it turns out, I can remember almost nothing from that show. So I'm really glad we're talking about GraphQL again. <laughs> Yeah, it's not something that I've used, but I do I do appreciate the sort of the ecosystem that grew up around REST and the sort of lack of metadata, you know, that surrounds it in all of these ways that we've tried to implement it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh so tell me what are you, what's the tool set? You know, what do you use for this? You say there's a playground, but you know, what about Visual Studio? Is it just is there, are there any API APIs? <laughs> Well, I I will say that there's a lot of tools out there, but one thing I recommend is starting out from bare bones because there's a recognition. There are some people that I really respect that are being very successful with GraphQL Mm. that are using no tooling. Um, They are literally making HTTP calls to Mm. a GraphQL endpoint. The thing to keep in mind, uh, the way GraphQL works is it's very different than a RESTful API. You have a single endpoint uh, and that endpoint only accepts post requests and it always returns an HTTP 200, always. Even if you get an error, it's going to return a 200 and there will be an error property on the response. So, very opinionated that way. Hmm. But again, these sorts of opinions help developers run faster. I think about how often through my career, I've been having conversations about, well, how does your API uh, handle errors? What are those error structures going to look like? Are we going to have an array of errors? Are we going to have key value pairs? Uh, And again, those aren't the things that are helping the company make more money or really affect the user experience. They're just technical details. So I like that, that level of opinion there. Uh, So this is something that I like to do when showing people GraphQL 
is uh, show the very simplest of apps where uh, GitHub, for instance, GitHub has a GraphQL API mm -hmm. and you are free to go out there and interact with it via the web. But you can also, uh, of course, call it via HTTP. And uh, to do so, you make a fetch request or you could use Axios, whatever library you want to use to make HTTP calls mm. and you send it a query in the body. And that query is nothing, uh, nothing special. It's a string that's formatted in GraphQL's uh, query uh, format, but it is in the end uh, just a string. So you could go out, interact with uh, GitHub's graphical uh instance and create some queries and say, for instance, okay, I'm going to try querying for one of my repos on GitHub. And once I get that query to respond, I can copy that query, paste it into my application and it works. Uh, and it mm. works by me making an HTTP call. Uh, now at some point though, people uh, are likely to want to reach for something more than that. And there is a uh, uh, Relay and Apollo are two very popular open source projects out there that give you a lot of opinion uh, along with working in with GraphQL. And when I say opinion, I mean uh, things like caching, for instance, uh, th things like being able to say, all right, uh, I want to be able to just put a component on the page and have it to be able to declare my query without explicitly having to make an HTTP call uh, to some endpoint. Mm. Uh, so those tools uh, come in handy, but uh, I, I think of this a lot like uh, back in the jQuery days where I would see people that made the mistake of learning jQuery before they learned JavaScript. <laughs> And you, you could get so far, but you'd find that at some point jQuery wasn't enough. And then you'd be a bit confused about how to get everything else done. Uh, and, and so the same risk happens for GraphQL developers. I suggest starting out with just playing GraphQL yeah. and then uh, build a small app that way. Get comfortable with the whole uh, ecosystem there and then uh, reach out and look at the open source projects like Relay or Apollo uh, and in that point, they can solve a lo lot of other pain points uh, for you. Things like pagination and normalization, caching identical requests and making optimistic updates. All those are things that you're likely to want in a real app. But feeling uh, feeling the pain and getting comfortable with how the the base technology works is a good way to, to make sure that you don't feel uh, the pain of leaky abstractions later. Are there sample apps out there that you like that's a great way to sort of get your feel for GraphQL? Oh, yeah. Um, in fact, so I have a, a slide deck right now and a, a GitHub repo. I'll, I'll share the GitHub repo link here at the mm -hmm. uh, for the show notes, but uh, where I put together links to uh, various projects that I've found useful. The, the nice thing about the GraphQL ecosystem is there are a number of different companies and then individuals who have stood up uh, GraphQL endpoints just for playing around. Um, that said, my favorite way to learn GraphQL is through the GitHub GraphQL uh, endpoint. And I'm really hoping that they keep this this one up because I'm sure lots of people are just using it for learning, which is sort of a, a waste of their resources, I imagine. Mm. Uh, but nonetheless, the reason that I recommend the uh, GitHub uh, graphical uh, repo or uh, graphical tool is if you go out there and interact with GitHub, you know the data structure. Uh, most likely, if you've ever worked with uh, Git before, you'll understand the idea of repositories and users and issues and pull requests. Right. So you can get comfortable joining those together and making queries. And you can even do some mutations like, uh, I want to star a repository and see that response come back. Because to clarify, although I've been talking about queries the whole time, of course, we need to edit and delete add data as well. So GraphQL right. lets you do mutations as well. And the way those mutations work is they end up looking a lot like an RPC call, except the body of that RPC call, I can declare what properties I'd like to get back once that mutation succeeds. So for instance, I could star a GitHub repo and then say that when I get that back, I'd like to get the ID for the repo and I'd like to get the number of stars that that repo currently has mm -hmm. in the response. So you think about with a traditional uh, RESTful API, when I would make a, a call to mutate some data, whether it be via post or put, I don't get a say on exactly what comes back. It's it's 
the developer's decision who originally wrote it. Whereas in GraphQL, I, I always have the option to declare exactly what I want. And this is something that's pretty powerful too, because you think about how often we're standing up separate mobile endpoints and mm-hmm. web endpoints just to save some bandwidth and to reduce some chattiness. Mm-hmm. And in fact, if, if you back up to GraphQL has actually been around since about 2012, because that's when they started using it at Facebook. They waited a few years before they open sourced it in 2015. And the onus for creating GraphQL was exactly that, that they wanted to ha- be able to make different requests for their mobile apps than they did for the web app. Without making separate endpoints. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you don't have a maintenance issue then. Right. And I, there you th- you're thinking, what, what I appreciate about you talking, I'm still on about the OData thing, is really mm-hmm. the, you know, OData was very much focused on, I want to expose a database to the internet in a safe way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this is a, quite a bit of different emphasis that I want to be able to customize my returns uh, based on the, on the consumer that I want. I have a diversity of consumption. It's not necessarily a data store per se, unless you consider everything that has an API a data store, which is, you know, technically, I guess GitHub is a data store. It's just not necessarily <laughs> the same thing as rows and columns. Yeah. So it just yeah. seems to me a, a more diverse set of thinking. Well, I think it's interesting uh, because when OData came out, the perception that I had was OData was open by default, Uh, as in, if you choose OData, then uh, if you just stand it up out of the box, then whatever you're pointing it at, you can run whatever arbitrary queries that you want, and then you can choose to start locking them down over time. Uh, Whereas GraphQL has taken a different tack, which is saying, you create a schema, and that schema declares uh, what is going to happen behind the scenes. So when I ask for a GitHub repository, there is this idea of resolvers behind the scenes. And what those resolvers do is they actually make the call for me on my behalf. So GraphQL actually defaults to closed uh, rather than open. And what the way that you open things up in GraphQL is by declaring resolvers. And when I say a resolver, a resolver could end up making a call to some other API, like a RESTful API behind the scenes. And in fact, that's one of the nicest things about GraphQL is if today you're a team with a bunch of APIs, you can wrap those APIs with GraphQL in very little code because you need to declare a schema and then you now have a GraphQL endpoint that will wrap all of those calls. And now you can start saying, I only want part of the data, or I want the data to be in this shape. And behind the scenes, the GraphQL server will end up making those calls to different APIs or databases for you, Mm -hmm. and then gluing all that data together in the way that you've requested. But this this idea of being, I think, closed by default um, may also be something that has helped GraphQL to catch on because it... uh, it lowers blood pressure a bit. I, I think when OData came out, that was the the thing that I found hardest to sell my boss on. And in fact, we ultimately didn't end up getting to use it, at least my current boss, because he was very conservative mm-hmm. and was concerned about the, the open nature of OData. And I actually don't know that that's a particularly valid concern. I think it was no. more a perception issue. And sure. maybe we've come farther now because honestly, I don't see any reason that you can't solve the exact same problems with OData that you do with GraphQL. They're really vanilla versus chocolate ice cream. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. But so, so I still, I, I agree with you guys that I think uh, OData at this point, it's more just a, a marketing and perception issue. Maybe yeah. just ahead of its time. Yeah. Uh, v- very much, I think, ahead of its time yeah. because we hadn't yet realized all the ways that REST APIs were starting to create some pain as well. Sure. Uh, so you, you've got to have some time for people to be, be frustrated by the current state before they realize that the medicine is, is, uh, worth it. And, Absolutely. and I yeah. think we're there now. Well, Hey Richard. Yeah, buddy. Guess what time it is now? Uh, it must be that happy time again. Yeah. It's time to climb up on my roof and refactor a few leaky abstractions. <laughs> With a, <laughs> some duct tape and, uh, and a tarp? Nope. Caulk. 
<laughs> That's it. And, and you realize if I go searching on GitHub, there are projects called TARP and COP. I'm sure and, there are. Every yeah, noun in the English language has a project associated there with it. There you go. Yeah. yeah every, even some that don't exist. Any monosyllable word has That's a project right. associated with it now. It's true. Yeah. Well, it's actually time to give away a $200 Amazon gift card to one lucky member of the .NET Rocks fan club. Compliments of Progress Telerik. But first, let me tell you about Conversational UI from Progress Telerik and Kendo UI. Conversational UI are chatbot framework agnostic user interface controls and components that enable .NET and JavaScript developers to create modern conversational chatbot experiences in their web, mobile, and desktop applications. The industry's first packaged set of user interface components built specifically for chatbots is available as part of the company's Telerik ASP.NET AJAX, ASP.NET MVC, ASP.NET Core, WinForms, WPF, and Xamarin products, and Kendo UI for jQuery, Angular, Vue, React, PHP, and JSP libraries. And by implementing key UI design features such as calendars, date pickers, list views, and others that are included in the tool sets, developers will be able to improve chatbot conversation through visual elements that enhance the natural flow of conversation. For more info, visit Telerik.com slash conversational dash UI. All right, buddy. Who's our winner? Today's winner is Brett Knoll. Congratulations, Brett. Yeah. Golf clap for you. Golf clap for Brett Null. He just won a $200 Amazon gift card. Compliments of Progress Telerik just for being a member of the .NET Rocks fan club. And if you'd like to become a member, it's easy. Go to .NET Rocks.com, click on the big Get Free Stuff button, answer a few questions, and join up. We have thousands of members all over the world. In every show, we like to give away stuff from our sponsors. And every December, we give away a $5,000 technology shopping spree to one lucky member of the fan club, but you have to sign up to win. All right, Corey, you know the drill. We're going shopping with five grand for technology. What are you going to buy? Oh, I've had fun thinking about this one. Uh, This is an odd one. Uh, Not directly related to programming, though, but I really love the idea of owning an electric car, but I still have uh, enough concerns about finding a charging station and and concerns that I might forget to plug it in one night and then find myself not being able to get where I need to go. So uh, what I would love to see is some company that offers a $5,000 kit that allows me to transfer a battery in and out to hot swap it. And I've seen some videos huh. of huh. this that I, I totally believe that this is the future because, I mean, you, you look at even the Tesla uh, superchargers, they charge fast, but they are still not near as fast as gassing up a vehicle. And I right. think that's where we need to get for electric vehicles to truly catch on. And this idea of having a standardization among automakers where you say the battery is on the bottom, which they already are already, but on the bottom in such a way that you can uh, move a a few mounts and the battery just drops out and you plop a new one in. And we effectively standardize on small, medium and large batteries, something like this, Hmm. where I, I love that idea of just pulling in the battery drops out, you put a new one in and gone. So sort of a a core replacement. And that is something that could theoretically happen as fast as a uh, gas fill up. Yeah. Tesla did a demo of something like this. Mm -hmm. And their guideline was like five minutes, which is like filling a tank. Yep. The, the, uh, the interesting part about it, I see several advantages to that idea. I mean, besides this quick charging time, it's also a way to keep the batteries ever fresh. Like yeah. you would sign up for this service. And so now you're no longer sort of dependent on the battery being is bound to the vehicle. I don't think it would be the whole battery. I think it would be a portion. So you're never going to get to a hundred percent. But as, as I have friends who are Tesla owners, they never charge to a hundred percent. They charge to 80. It's better for the battery. So what if there were portions yeah. of the battery that are, you know, that this represents 50% of the total battery and that's all you switch out. Right. And it's enough charge to get you where you want to go, but not necessarily, you know, you don't, you're not filling up because you don't normally fill up anyway. I just wonder if this, this whole issue becomes moot when we go to fully autonomous driving and you just don't own the vehicle anymore. You just call up a new vehicle whenever you need one. That's true. How about smaller batteries, more smaller batteries that can easily be, you know, popped in and out just like you would a, a, a multi-disc CD player? Well, so what would the advantage of that be? 
Well, because then, you know, you don't have this, you don't have to have this big infrastructure to, you know, uh, take the bolts off the bottom, put the battery in like the, you know, it's like an oil change. Whereas mm -hmm. you have little ones that can be, you know, that any consumer can just, you know, 12 pop out, 12 pop in. They're, they're uh, light enough that you can handle them one at a time. So and effectively, you could be on the side of the road and have those sitting in your trunk, maybe? Yeah, either that or just go up to a, a, a station, a filling station, you know, up oh, says you need, you know, 12 or eight or whatever. So you just eight uh -huh. pop out, eight go in. They're easy to handle. You don't need a, a big infrastructure, just some sort of, um, you know, mechanism for getting them in and out. I don't know. Let's make it happen. Let's do it. Yeah, I think it, I think weight's a problem. I do wonder about what the the triple A guy does when a, a electric car is dead by the <laughs> side of the road. Yeah, <laughs> did, do they start Char carrying generators so they can actually <laughs> charge you up? Huh. Uh, so I I at least heard a rumor that uh, Quick Trip uh, had interest in putting electric charging stations in, and they haven't been able to do it because they have such a close tie with the oil industry. Uh, and yeah. so they end up biting the hand that feeds them. Uh, so, because this is what's wild to me is still to this day, there's not a single gas station that I've seen that has any charging stations at them. No, right. and they're it, always separate. It's just like we're at, we're at this point where logically you'd have a couple of bays there and go ahead and make it a, a profit center, but it's just not there yet. Cause I, I would, I would imagine if you're out in the middle of nowhere and you come across a station that has a charger, you'll pay good money for that electricity because where else are you going to go? You're kind of screwed without it. Yeah. I have a buddy who's got a Model 3 and he lives in an apartment where they don't have enough power to, for him to put a charging point in for his parking space. But <laughs> there's enough chargers at stores. Like it's, it's actually premium parking, you know, alongside the handicap spots. Now there's EV spots. Mm -hmm. And so he's been maintaining, he was actually up here on the coast where I am and the pub up the road has a couple of, of charging spots. And so we went and had a beer and spent two hours on the patio to get him enough charge to get home. Wow. You're saving the world by drinking beer. That's pretty cool. <laughs> That's it. But, but also think of it from the pub's perspective for whatever thousand dollars or so it took them to put that charging point in. They got people to show up and drink beer. Right. Yeah. And then they, drive because home. Because the power's, t power's 10 cents a kilowatt, right? Like he consumed in two hours 80 cents worth of power. Yeah. You're never going to make money on the electricity. But if you can no. put it somewhere can, where you want to hang out long enough to get your charge, well, now you're talking. It's like why mm -hmm. there's ATM machines in stores and bars. Yeah. Same reason. It facilitates yep. transactions. Yeah. So what do you guys do in GraphQL about versioning? your APIs? So versioning is an interesting conversation. Uh, one thing that GraphQL does that is different than other APIs is you can mark fields as deprecated. Ooh. And when you mark a field as deprecated, your users get a notification about that. So in that way, you can end up uh, morphing your API over time. And for that matter, you can actually get analytics to know what properties people are using on your objects. So remember, with GraphQL, you can arbitrarily say, hey, I want to get a user back, but I only want the first name, the last name, and the email, none of the other properties that are stored in the database. And that'll keep my request nice and small. Well, as the developer for that API, I can go out and look at reports and see, okay, people are using first name and last name all the time, but nobody has ever asked for eye color here. So yeah. I could safely stop off Offering that piece of data and I don't have to worry about breaking any of my clients um, or I could mark it as deprecated for a while so that people understand that that exists and then later take it out. So the, the way that you end up managing uh, relational databases is fairly similar to the way that GraphQL handles versioning. Uh, as long as you don't go <laughs> removing things that people are obviously using, you can add all you want and you're not going to hurt anybody. There's no idea of a version two of a GraphQL endpoint. It's uh, an ongoing uh, endpoint that you can change however you like, but obviously removing properties is something that you should uh, only do after marking it deprecated for a while so that people can respond. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Mm -hmm. But I also like the idea that you're not doing big version drops. You're not a V1, V2. You do what you need when you need to. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really liked the uh, symmetry with the way we think about databases. You don't you don't drop columns on a, a table or rename tables on a normal basis either, because you'll almost certainly ruin a lot of people's day. Um, so the same rules apply here. You've got to make sure that nobody's using it before you take it away, but feel free to add it will. Cool. Yeah, I like it. So what does things like Relay and Apollo do? A lot of things. Uh, I, I can speak more to Apollo because honestly, I haven't used Relay. Um, Apollo is getting so much attention that it's it's almost become the de facto way to do GraphQL now. There are very few right. people that are, are choosing to do GraphQL with Relay um, and uh, a small minority that are choosing to do just plain GraphQL, which absolutely works. It's just you miss out on a lot of goodness. So when you choose to use something like Apollo, um, your queries become more declarative. You no longer end up explicitly making an HTTP call to the GraphQL server. Mm. Um, it does that for you. Uh, you can also co-locate your, your data layer and your view layer. Um, you can batch multiple queries into one request. So if your application, for whatever reason, needed to make multiple queries, uh, Apollo will batch those for you. So it's only one HTTP call. That's fairly rare because most of the time, you're going to be able to make a single call to get all the data that you need since you have so much control over declaring that query's uh, desired shape. Um, it also normalizes your data. Uh, so it makes sure then if I end up uh, editing some user data later, it's going to store that local in my cache in a normalized way so that I make sure that I don't end up storing that same user in two different places. So it's a bit like I have a relational database sitting on my client, uh, and it handles that for you. Uh, if you're using just plain GraphQL, then you're going to end up having to write your own logic to make sure that you don't make a, an unnecessary HTTP call right. and that you don't end up storing the same data twice. It also does nice things like uh, pagination uh, for you. It has some opinionated uh, takes on that. And uh, it also makes it easier to update your state on the client. Um, and this is going to be something that's a little more specific to if you're doing GraphQL with Angular, it's going to look a little bit different than GraphQL with uh, React, for instance. Uh, but nonetheless, there are libraries for Angular, for Vue, for React, for Ember, for many popular client side libraries that help connect them together. They're, they're again, they're absolutely, un they're not necessary. They're just nice to haves that most people choose to use. Cool. Yeah, I don't know what about more there is there yeah, to really. say. What have we missed out on here? <laughs> I'm with you. This thing seems to work. Yeah, well, so so I will say this. Um I don't want to be all sunshine and roses here. Let, let's talk about right. some of the downsides. Um there there are um a few significant downsides to GraphQL and I think uh, I think about it like this. Um one obvious downside is that freedom isn't free. Uh, and I think about it, uh, this metaphor of you walk into a subway to get a sandwich and at subway, you can have a sandwich almost any way you want it. And you're choosing your bread and your cheese and your meat and your lettuce and tomatoes, yada, yada, yada. Well, that is exactly why subway takes a little bit longer to get you your sandwich than some other store like Jimmy John's, for instance, that talks about how they're freaky fast because you go in there and you choose from one of a dozen sandwiches and they can make it really quickly because they make that exact same sandwich uh, 100 times a day, and they have a process set up to do that really quickly. And to some degree, that's uh, that's exactly the, the downside with GraphQL, that you are less likely to have a cache hit with GraphQL than you are with something like uh, an RPC-style API or a RESTful API that um, many people are building today. Uh, and I say that because you think about in GraphQL, you and I may be both requesting that exact same user, but if I'm requesting one different property than you are, that's not a cache hit because mm, they're different right. requests. It's of only course. a cache hit if I'm calling the exact same thing. So, so that's a, a downside. Um, traditional APIs in that way will tend to give you more cache hits and in that way be a little bit faster. Uh, so that's fairly significant. Caching is probably the biggest uh, struggle with GraphQL because when you think about RESTful APIs, RESTful APIs, we've been around quite a while now and um, we've gotten really good at handling the uh, caching story here. So we have good HTTP caching layers and we can lean on the nature of HTTP to get a lot of this stuff done. 
But since GraphQL more or less ignores HTTP, and in fact, right. you don't even have to use HTTP with uh, GraphQL. I've, I've been saying that you make a, a call and you get a 200 and you always do posts, but GraphQL, uh, the specification makes no opinion on that. So you could choose to call your server using uh, other protocols. Um, but nonetheless, that is a definite downside that um, if, if you're wanting the ultimate performance, then GraphQL does end up costing you a bit uh, in cash hits and, and the overhead of those customized queries compared to something like an RPC style API. Right. Now, I do think that balances out a bit because what you have to recognize is with GraphQL, I'm consistently getting exactly the data that I want. So over the wire, my call is lighter with GraphQL than with alternative technologies. So uh, it's not necessarily going to be less performant in the end, but there is a trade-off that, that's worth considering. The, the other uh, significant uh, risk with GraphQL is expensive queries. Uh, okay. If, if you open up the door for people to be able to say, I want a Facebook user and their friends, and I want that person's friends, and I want that person's friends, and I want that person's friends, you can end up creating a query that is nested 12 layers deep, and you can imagine what that does to your database. The mm. SQL calls that are made behind the scenes there would be wildly expensive. Yummy. So there are a number of ways that you can resolve this, one being max depth of saying, hey, you can you can include related data, but you can't include related data for related data for related data. We've, we've got to cut you off at some point. Yeah. Uh, and I think of the metaphor of, you know, you could go to Burger King and they talk about have it your way. But you can't go into Burger King and say that you want 12 hamburger patties on a bun. There, there's a point that they go, no, you, <laughs> that's a stack overflow. We're, we're going to have to say no to you there. Um, so that same thing needs to happen in GraphQL. You've got to put in some good parameters. And there's other ways that you can do this, like uh, throttling of saying, hey, we're going to give you um, this many requests or timeouts where we say any call that you make that takes longer than two seconds, we're going to automatically cancel it to avoid hammering our server. So there's ways around these things, but these are some concerns that are definitely worth looking into. Absolutely. That's cool. Are there any other issues that we should be aware of? Well, I, I will say the one other interesting point that people made um, that I hadn't really considered was with uh, GraphQL, you are coupling the UI to your API. Ah. And one of the big sales pitches of REST APIs when Roy Fielding wrote his dissertation was having uh, this disconnect, this uh, separation of concerns between your API and your UI. And your UI would make a call to the API and then it would get back uh, links to other things. So if I asked for a Facebook user, then it could respond and tell me, okay, here's this user. And if you want, here's a link to their wall. Here's a link to their friends and call this uh, endpoint to get that data. So RESTful APIs make you think in terms of lazy loading because you make a call and then you get links to other pieces of data. Mm. Now, given that's assumed that you're truly building an, a RESTful API that embraces hypermedia. And in my experience, virtually nobody does this. Um, the, <laughs> the little survey that I just did yesterday, and this is of people following me on Twitter, who I, I imagine most people following on, me on Twitter are pretty serious about uh, a dev because they're spending time talking about geeky stuff on Twitter. Um, but even there, it was uh, about 5% of the people that were doing REST were claiming to do hypermedia. Uh, uh -huh. So, I believe hypermedia is um, an interesting topic, but something that is very rarely done because it's it's hard to do well. And a lot of people still to this day aren't, uh, I think, aren't even aware of what hypermedia is and what to do with it. I saw a number of people still struggle when they see Hadios or however you say it out li loud, mm -hmm. the hypermedia as the engine of application state. It's a huge mouthful, mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's the idea of sending links to different things. And RESTful APIs make you think in terms of Here's a link to that other data, whereas GraphQL tends to make people think in terms of, oh, I'm just going to get all that data at once. And that can lead to people pulling in more data than necessary um, rather than lazy loading like they should. So ironically, right. GraphQL could actually make your site take longer to load initially because developers asked for more data than they needed up front just to be able to avoid subsequent HTTP calls later. So I noticed the list of uh, companies using GraphQL is pretty vast and pretty amazing. Like, I mean, the big ones like Facebook and GitHub, like you said, 
mm-hmm. uh, but Intuit, um, KLM, mm-hmm. uh, Pinterest, PayPal. Yep. Like Amazon, IBM, Amazon. Walmart. It's pretty yep. New pretty York big. Times, Docker, Airbnb, lots Yelp. of big names. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty amazing. impressive. Uh, yeah, so a lot of people have, have caught on to it. And really, uh, my thing is, uh, I, the biggest value that I've found from Twitter is just, it gives me a good sense of what people are excited about. Um, so I finally dipped my toes into GraphQL because I saw enough people that were excited about it. Uh, so I said, all right, this is, this is worth taking the time. Right. So what's on your radar, man? What's next for you? Well, I'm excited because, uh, I'm doing a talk at KCDC in my hometown here of Kansas city, uh, nice. here very soon. And in fact, I guess this will be in the past by the time this publishes, but, um, that'll be my uh, uh, big debut of this talk I've written on GraphQL. I don't know, guys, if I'm going to have enough time, though, because my slide deck has 250 slides in it for an hour long. Holy talk. man. Wowzers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I may need a precompiler instead. But yeah, uh, the, I guess the good news is I can I can get up there and uh, yammer for a while. I, I've always thought that it's less stressful to have too much content than not enough. I don't, I don't want to get True. up there and let people out after 15 minutes on a, on an hour long conversation. Wow. Yeah. As long as you can judge how you're going and drop bits so that it, you don't just race the end. I think that's an art form. I prefer to have more mm-hmm. material, which is the norm and just figure out, okay, we don't need to go too deep here because we're, we're going to run out of time. Yep. 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 Got to read the audience. Yeah. All right, man. Awesome, dude. Yeah, that's good stuff. Well, keep in touch and come on back when there's new stuff to talk about. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, guys. You bet. Thanks for being here. And we'll talk to you next time on .NET Rock. .NET Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net and produced by Pwop Studios, a full-service audio, video, and post-production facility located physically in New London, Connecticut, and, of course, in the cloud. Online at pwop.com. Visit our website at dotnetrocks.com for RSS feeds, downloads, mobile apps, comments, and access to the full archives going back to show number one recorded in September 2002. And make sure you check out our sponsors. They keep us in business. Now go write some code. See you next time. Got a